Well, let's talk about this matter of, of sickness and illness, especially in the Christian's life. Um, I suppose um, it has been said that all sickness, all illness, st stems from sin. And uh, it's also been said that all illness stems from Satan. Well, this is uh, true in one sense, but it's an oversimplification. Uh, if there had never been sin, which was instigated by Satan, then there would never have been illness. And uh, as soon as there is no more sin, there will uh, be uh, no more sickness. So in there's just one sense in which uh, sin is responsible for, uh, for illness. And it's also true that God has, uh, all through the scriptural record, given uh, indications or given accounts of people having become ill because of their own sin as judgment <coughs> against sin and this has been both uh, towards the unsaved and towards uh, God's own people you'll remember such accounts for instance as Miriam the uh, sister of Moses who was stricken with leprosy for seven days because uh, she uh, uh, wouldn't recognize the authority that God had given to Moses and the older sister wanted to intrude upon the uh, the office there and you recall how God brought uh, terrible uh, sickness uh, uh, to the Egyptians on one occasion and to the uh, Philistines on another occasion uh, in a matter of judgment remember when they took the Ark of the Covenant I believe you'll find this in 1 Samuel chapter 6 and uh, they uh, had boils all over their bodies. And uh, you'll remember, for instance, uh, when uh, the uh, young Israelite men committed harlotry with the uh, Moabite uh, young women, that it brought on uh, uh, a plague of illness. And so uh, there are accounts, of course, where uh, illness was brought about uh, as a matter of judgment. And not only illness to the person who sinned, but there are accounts that illness was brought on uh, to others because of, of the sin of an individual. Uh, but in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 9, we have a question asked directly by the uh, disciples. They wanted to know why a particular man had an affliction. It's amazing how many times questions are answered directly in the scripture. And answers are given about which the Christian community as a whole is much perplexed. Uh, just as an example, uh, you may recall that in the 13th chapter of Matthew, there's an account of um, the disciples asking Christ a very pointed question. They said, why do you speak to the multitude in parables? Why do you use parables? Why do you use figurative language instead of coming right out and, and saying it in plain language? And if we were to ask the average uh, Sunday school student why, uh, what he learned in Sunday school about why uh, Christ spoke in parables, they would say, well, it was to... Uh, make a spiritual truth more down to earth or give a uh, more uh, an, an answer uh, put a spiritual truth in terms that we could understand well this certainly is not the answer Christ gave and it was a direct question they said why do you speak unto the multitude in parables and his answer was because there are certain truths that are given to my disciples to know but not given to the multitudes so I speak in parables so that certain truths will be hidden to the multitudes and revealed to the spiritually inclined of course this is one of the principal reasons for uh, for figurative language all through the Bible is that the minds of the wise and the prudent might be confused and that the uh, mind or, or individual who who uh, seeks enlightenment enlightenment from God might receive it and this, of course, is why James wrote in James 1.5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, 
who give it to all men liberally. So here we have one of those questions in uh, uh, John chapter 9, verse 1, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now you might think that's a rather stupid question. How possibly could this uh, be because of this man's sin if he was born blind? How could he have sinned before he was ever born? Well, if you stop and think it through, it might not be uh, such a, a, a foolish question because Christ had just told them recently that uh, it's better if you lost an eye or an arm or something, if that should cause you to sin, it's better that you enter into heaven minus some of your body members than to go into hell with a whole body. And uh, so they might have reasoned this way, that uh, God foreknew that this man would, uh, uh, that his lust of the eyes would be his downfall, and therefore he graciously permitted him to be blind so that he wouldn't fall into that condemnation. So there might have been some valid reason for such a question. In other words, uh, is this man blind because God foreknew that uh, he would misuse his sight and therefore bring condemnation on his soul? Uh, or is he blind because his parents committed some sin? You might say, well, that's an awful foolish question. But is it? Uh, you remember David sinned and his little child uh, was sick because of David's sin. The Bible plainly says this. You can find the story in the Second Samuel, I believe it's chapter 12 and 13, the story of David's sin and the, the subsequent uh, deathly illness of the little child that was born to David and Bathsheba. You might say, isn't this a harsh thing on the part of God to uh, let this little child suffer because of his parents' sin? Well, it happens all the time. Children suffer all over the world because of their parents' sin. Uh, when you get to heaven, uh, you might want to ask this child. And you can be sure the child will be there. David said he would. Under inspiration of God, David said that the child will not come back to me, but I shall go to him. So uh, you'll have a chance to question this child. And you know what you might find out? you might find out that he's already known that he would have suffered the same fate as some of David's other sons, like uh, Absalom and Ammon, uh, uh, who are, uh, became ungodly men. Maybe it was a merciful thing this uh, child died before he heaped up judgment to himself. I'm quite sure that this is the reason for the death of many children and young people, especially in godly homes. God foresees that the child would completely ruin the testimony or the opportunity of the family to serve God in his light. And he foresees that uh, the continued life of a particular young person would, uh, would bring great reproach on the family or uh, might even uh, 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 cause uh, a, a whole life of, of just utter uh, defeat. And sometimes it's a, it's a gracious thing if God takes a young person out of the world uh, before he fouls up uh, his own uh, eternal future and that of many of his uh, uh, relatives, you might say. God knows these things, and we'll find them out when we get there. So sometimes this is a valid reason for the death of a young person. God foresees that the continued life would be detrimental both to his program and to those involved. So it may not have been uh, a terrible thing that happened to this little boy. Uh, speaking of Ammon, uh, this is probably one reason that when some people get sick. You remember Ammon feigned sickness. Remember the story of how uh, he uh, uh, had bodily lust for his half-sister, the, uh, the whole sister of Absalom, and so... Uh, Someone gave him some advice, says, well, here's what you do. He says, you uh, go get in bed and let everybody think you're sick, and then you uh, say that uh, uh, you need her attention, and then you can seduce her. 
and uh, actually that didn't work too well and he actually had to overpower the girl but uh, he satisfied his bodily lust and then he hated her uh, well of course this little game uh, that Ammon played is a favorite among uh, many of us that is that part of feigning illness uh, any of you that raised children have known that sometimes your children uh, put on in order to get attention or get out of work or something like that all I have to do is look at back in my own life come home from school and I didn't want to get out and work and uh, do the chores and such as that and uh, I uh, often conveniently got a headache and if you try hard enough you can actually get one maybe God lets you accommodate you uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, the older folks too uh, to get sympathy or attention uh, we feign illness or we make out that we're worse than we are uh, or we're glad and maybe if we don't make out worse but we're glad for people to think that we're worse than we are this is uh, just a part of our perverted thinking so uh, this is uh, undoubtedly the reason for some illness uh, the, the illness is really not there or not as bad and of course uh, much illness is just because uh, we don't regard our bodies uh, there's a there's a, an elderly lady in Lakeland um, my wife uh, ministers to her quite frequently and uh, I'm just as convinced as anything in the world that she was saved uh, about 15 years ago but she's an alcoholic and uh, every now and then it gets the best of her and she hides her bottle around and right now she happens to be on a binge and uh, sometimes she'll go years but uh, the devil knows she's weak there and uh, uh, she uh, she just has this problem uh, well it brings on other problems partly from her tremendous uh, weight of guilt uh, that causes her bodily harm and uh, for other such reasons but uh, so a lot of our illness is just simply self-induced we think we can go further than we can go and uh, or we think we can uh, sleep less than we ought to or eat the wrong kind of things or uh, we have mental frustrations or uh, there, there's all types of things that uh, bring on illness uh, and we're not just because we're saved we're not completely immune from that type of thing as a matter of fact Satan one of Satan's tricks is to do whatever he can to bring about bodily illness so I suppose this was a valid question and Christ answers it very pointedly here in John chapter 9 he says in verse 3 Jesus answered neither hath this man sinned nor his parents but that the works of God should be made manifest in him so this man was afflicted for a purpose that God had in his life and you say well that's pretty bad for a fellow have to be uh, blind all of his young life uh, just so God could show forth his uh, greatness that doesn't seem quite fair and I'll tell you what you do you'll be able to see this fellow too in heaven because it's very clear uh, that his whole experience is a picture of salvation and when you see him in heaven you go up to him and he wouldn't change places with anybody in the world he'll just be so happy that uh, God uh, uh, used his life to record an episode in God's book the whole chapter is about him about and many lessons are taught in this chapter as a matter of fact I probably taught as many Bible lessons from this chapter as any other one and you know it's most much quoted in people's testimonies many times you hear them say uh, whereas I was blind now I see and uh, of course uh, that's what he said when uh, they kept questioning him uh, as to uh, what happened to him and uh, he uh, he says I, I can't uh, I can't answer anything but that 
But I know that I was blind, and I know that I now see. Well, if you think through this story, remember, Christ anointed his eyes. And when Christ anointed his eyes, did he see? No. He said, go to the pool of Siloam, which means sent, and wash. And he went and washed and came back seeing. This is a beautiful picture of God's part in our salvation and our part. It's impossible for us to be saved unless God anoints our spiritually blind eyes. But it's equally impossible for us to be saved if faith doesn't respond. And had this man not uh, exercised faith, uh, he would have never seen. You say, well, didn't God even give him the faith? <coughs> well, yes, and I'm not going to try to explain that. Uh, it, it, there's certainly a sense in which he deserves no credit whatsoever. But still, we see the exercise of faith. We see in Christ saying, you go and wash. And he went and washed. And, and it's in the seventh verse and he said unto him go wash in the pool of Sil Siloam which is by interpretation sent and he went away therefore and washed and came seeing of course the pool of Siloam here is the type of the uh, cleansing of the Holy Spirit the sent one he's actually the ones that open he, he operationally opens our eyes it wasn't the act of washing in the pool that brought the sight it was the Holy Spirit of God that brought the sight. It was, see, uh, there was a command by God, there was a response of faith, and then a reaction on God's part to the faith. And this is a beautiful picture of how you got saved. God saw that you were blind, and he anointed your eyes. And he ask you to receive that and you did and the Holy Spirit opened your eyes you came seeing but this teaches us a lot of other lessons did you ever think about this guy's mother and father here they had seen this uh, uh, son from a little baby blind and all of a sudden their son was miraculously healed so that he could see now they thought it was a marvelous thing but they kept it as quiet as they could. You know why? Because they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. Shows you how strong a hold traditional religion has on us. People will give up any promise of God and hold on to their tradition. And these people were fearful that they would be put out of the synagogue, and they would have been because he was. Notice in verse 34. And they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. They, uh, they cast him out of the uh, society. See, uh, uh, look at the 22nd verse. These words spoke his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue therefore said his parents he is of age ask him they don't want to be put out of the synagogue they knew that Christ had performed a miracle on this person but they had already been warned look if you confess that this one that made your son see if you confess that he's the Christ we'll put you out we'll excommunicate you and that was the worst thing that could happen to them doesn't this tell us a picture of a humanity bound in traditional religion well I really saw this in South America someone asked why are these people uh, so poor so many of them so poor in countries with such with such vast natural resources it's because the ecclesiastical system knows how to bleed every bit of substance out of them and build great ornate buildings and send it away to the hierarchy and so forth that's why it is you show me a country anywhere in the world that has a religious 
uh, control over them. And I'll show you a country that's politically unstable and economically destitute. Always. One follows the other. So religion has a terrible hold on people. All of those things come out. And God used this man to teach these lessons. But he was had a rejoicing heart. It really didn't matter to him. All he cared about was, whereas I was blind, now I see. Also, there's a beautiful revelation here of how uh, a person comes into a deeper understanding of Christ. Uh, he called him a man, and he called him a prophet, and pretty soon he called him the Messiah. Then he knew he was God. There was a progressive revelation uh, by the man who was healed. So this man was sick, Jesus said. This man had a bodily affliction so that God might show something, <coughs> so that the power of God might be shown forth. And as I say, when you see him, he'll tell you, all those years of blindness don't mean a thing to me. God's got all of eternity to pay me back for that. I wouldn't take anything for the experience. That's what he'll tell you. See, we, we'll think a little different in those days. Now in the 11th chapter of John, we have another man that was sick. Now a certain man was sick. His name Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And Jesus answered, and Jesus, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified by it. So why was this man sick? So that God might receive glory. And this is the reason some Christians are sick. Because the end result of the sickness and the recovery brings glory to God. And uh, the one who helped to glorify God in that way, they don't feel like they were misused. And here again, when you see Lazarus, he won't feel like he was misused. He says, look, the greatest thing that ever happened to me was to be dead four days. He says, I got put in the, he'll say, I got put in the holy book because of that. But the whole chapter's about me. Who else could have that honor? Don't feel sorry for me. Well, this, we learned some lessons here. Uh, there's another lesson in uh, verse 40 of this 11th chapter. Jesus said unto her, that is unto Martha, Said I not unto thee, if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of, the, of God. This is God's system. Believe and then see. We always want to see and then believe. God's program is believe first and then you'll really see. I suppose Thomas never realized until the Lord told him how much he robbed himself <laughs> by insisting on seeing first. Remember he said, unless I can see the wound, the nail prints in his hands. Unless I can see, I will not believe. And the Lord came there and said, put forth your hand, Thomas. See that his eyes, so that you might not be unbelieving. And then he said, you think you're blessed because you saw and believed? More blessed are those who not having seen believe. More blessed. So Lazarus was sick so that Christ might be glorified. And then we learned some other lessons here too. Uh, what was the reaction of the religious leaders when God raised him from the dead? Well, the chief mogul of all of God's uh, people uh, had his say. Notice in verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. 
that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who hath believed thy report? We're in chapter 12, verse 37. And to whom hath he revealed his arms? Therefore, uh, they could not believe. Many of them, you see, wouldn't believe, although they saw these miracles. Some believed, but some didn't. Now, back in the uh, 11th chapter again, notice in the 48th verse. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away our, both our place and the nations. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest, that same year said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation should not perish. Now, uh, look at verse 53. Then uh, from that day forth they took counsel together to put him to death. Now what they said, we need to kill both of these people. We need to kill the one that was raised from the dead, and we need to kill the one that raised him from the dead. Now this was the spiritual leadership gave this advice. Why would they give such advice? Well, they gave you the reason. They says, our place will be taken away. And here's the reaction of religious leaders. Anytime you have a demonstrative miracle, now there's a difference. Uh, somebody could have cancer and be miraculously healed. And uh, the cynical world could just say, well, they probably never really ever had cancer. It was just misdiagnosed. Or uh, uh, even somebody could be crippled. And they say, well, he just got well. But uh, by a demonstrative miracle, I mean something that couldn't possibly be explained, like, for instance, this man who everybody saw buried in a tomb, wrapped in grave clothes, buried in a tomb for four days, and then come walking out with his grave clothes on, grave clothes on him. Or a miracle like, for instance, when uh, Malchus's ear was cut off with a sword. Now, there wouldn't be any physical, logical explanation to that, would there? Well, what happens? What do the religious leaders do always when a demonstrative type of miracle takes place? Just read it anywhere in the Bible. How about in the, the third chapter of Acts when the man that was lying impotent at the gateway and had for 38 years lain there impotent? Uh, no, that was the man that... Bethesda that was 38 years. Well, this guy was, he was over 40, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Anyway, what happened? The religious leader says, if you do this anymore, uh, we'll have the, the Romans take you, carry you. We'll put you in jail and have you executed. And how about when uh, over in uh, Acts chapter 14, when Paul and Barnabas were on their missionary trek in Asia Minor and uh, there was a man raised from the dead there was it in Lyconium and uh, the uh, uh, they tried to make them gods well now you see if the religious leaders could have made everybody believe these two men were gods that would have been all right but when Paul and Barnabas says no we're not gods we're just people like you are. Then the religious leaders came and stoned them and dragged them out of town as though they were dead. You see, if somebody by the power of God performs a miracle that's obviously in unexplainable, then the, those who claim to be the spiritual leaders have to put up or shut up because they've claimed that they're the channels through whom God is working. So they've got to either acknowledge that they've been uh, a frauds or else they've got to do something to get this man out of the way. And if they can put him to death, the man that performs a miracle, if they can put him to death, of course they have the perfect doubt. See, he did this by Satan or something because if he'd have done it by God, God wouldn't let him be put to death. So uh, they will always try to put him to death. That's the reason that you just don't see 
that type of miracle today. Oh, there might be that type of miracle out in the hinterland where there's not a religious hierarchy to put the uh, miracle worker to death. But if that was to happen very often right in this country, that person's life wouldn't be worth two cents. The, uh, uh, the religious hierarchy would have him incarcerated or something right in this country. There wouldn't be any other way around. They certainly aren't going to admit that they aren't really God's agency in the world. And you start to think about that if you want to know why we don't have all of these miracles. Well, God's got better use for his servants. And don't ever kid yourself that it takes miracles to bring someone to Christ. Uh, this uh, rich man was told that. He says, look, if you'd send one, somebody from the dead to tell my five brothers what a horrible place hell is, they'd believe. God said to Abraham, no, they wouldn't. He said, if they wouldn't believe from the scriptures, they wouldn't believe even though God sent someone from the dead. If someone won't get saved because he hears the gospel, he won't get saved, period. There's nothing that will bring him to God if the gospel won't. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Miracles are not the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is. And the performing of miracles is no, uh, I mean, um, that so that people get, can get saved is no valid excuse for performing miracles. People get saved by the gospel, period. Now, if God wants to use that to glorify himself, that's his prerogative. He has in the past, no doubt he does in the present, and no doubt he will in the future. So one reason that you don't see uh, many of that type of, of miracle is because of the reaction you get. And you just read the scriptural accounts and you'll see what happened every time. If there was any religious voice around, What are some other reasons why uh, Christians get sick besides letting God show forth his power and for the glory of God? Well, uh, in uh, the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, we found some Christians that were sick because they were perverting worship. And God brought sickness on them. In the, uh, on the other side of the fence, we see uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's account of why he was sick. He says, I have a thorn in the flesh. Satan buffets me with it. He says, I asked God three times to remove it. God said, no. Paul, if I did, I know you and you would be exalted. He says, I do this for your own good so that it helps you to stay humble. And Paul says, now I'm, he says, I gladly bear this infirmity because it's through that that God's power can be shown forth. And he glory, he said he gloried in his infirmity. He was glad that he had it, his painful uh, thorn in the flesh, whatever it was. I'm sure it was painful because he described it as a thorn in the flesh. That's painful, isn't it? He said he's glad he had it. He said it made him more usable to God. So, sometimes God lets us suffer affliction because we thereby become more usable in his program. Uh, Paul gave some other reasons. He said a very strange thing in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. He said that the bringing forth of the body of Christ uh, requires a certain amount of suffering which was not completed when Christ was here on earth. He says, suffering brings about the salvation of people. And he says, I'm just so glad I can do my share. Now, if you want to bring this down more to earth, 
at our CDMC in Lakeland last Wednesday. Mm -hmm. A man from Lakeland, he's a salesman for Gator Concrete Company. Great hulk of a man. His name is Wilbur Smith. He gave his testimony. How his wife got saved several years before he did. And uh, that uh, he ridiculed her mercilessly. He wouldn't have anything to do with her religion whatsoever. Then he says that his little boy got deathly ill, was at the point of death for quite some time. <coughs> and he said that he never saw anything like the love that was showered upon his wife by her fellow Christian friends, how they came in and cooked, and how they came in and, and washed her other little children, and cleaned her clothes, and uh, just did everything for her. And he said this love of other Christians for his wife brought him to his knees. And he would tell you, or he did in his testimony, he said, God used the suffering of my little boy to bring me to Christ. He said, I don't believe I would have ever come any other way. So sometimes God permits sickness so that somebody can get saved. He melts their heart in this way. And it's not necessarily the illness of the person who responds. Or it might not be get saved. Now, uh, most of you have uh, an Myron Shewitt, don't you? Well, sometimes when you get Myron to talk to you in a very tender moment, he'll tell you about when one of his little sons died over on the mission field. Now, he had come to Christ long before this, and he dedicated his life to Christ. But he says, I never knew God. I never really knew God till he took my little boy. He said, it changed my whole ministry. He says, it was the most needful thing that ever happened to me. Now, it's a rather strange commentary that we're that way. But God knows, you see. So why was his little child sick? Because God wanted to use Myron Schuett's life. I've told you the story of Catherine Watson, the pastor of the Covenant Presbyterian Church in Lakeland, is Tom Watson. Tom is the son of the man who was Attorney General for the state of Florida for many, many years. He was born in Tampa. And when he was a young man in his early 30s, he uh, owned a radio station in Bell Glade, Florida. And he was saved. He had a wife and four children. She was also saved. They sold everything they had and went to Bible school and went out as missionaries to Japan. They wanted to uh, found a radio station in Japan. And... Uh, to broadcast the gospel into Japan and especially to Siberia. And they couldn't get one there, but they got opened up a way for them to put a radio station much closer to Russia and Manchuria. And uh, that's radio uh, station HLKX. Tom Watson is the founder of that radio station. And for years it was the only station that broadcast the gospel in the Mandarin language, which is spoken by hundreds of millions of Chinese people, probably spoken by as many people as there are in the United States. The gospel was going out in other Chinese languages like Cantonese, but not in Mandarin. And he also, it was the first radio station which broadcast the gospel to Siberia on standard wave. Always before, if anybody wanted to hear the gospel in Siberia, they had to listen in on short wave. And most of the radio stations there are standard way. Well, they broadcast the gospel from Inchon, but they didn't have a suitable studio for recording. And the quality was rather poor because of that. And so he came back and made a tour of the United States in order to uh, raise money for that uh, uh radio uh, that place when all over the United States speaking the team he w was under the auspices of the Evangelical Alliance mission team and they organized a tour for him he's here for more than a year 
he didn't even raise uh, 10% of enough money. And he went by, back rather dejected. When he got back to Korea, he found out that his wife had cancer, terminal cancer. So rather sadly, he uh, brought her and the children, little children, back to the United States. And she was from Fort Lauderdale, and she died there in Fort Lauderdale in November of 1959. And someone started a Catherine Watson Memorial Fund. And within just weeks, far more than enough money to build a beautiful recording studio was raised as a memorial to Catherine Watson. And that studio has been used over there ever since. Catherine Watson Memorial Studio. Now you see, it took her death. Now she had four little children. When she died, one of them was, well, I've, known, I've known all of them. Most of them went to school over at Hampton Bowes Academy. Some of them with my daughter. Yet, God knew it was necessary to forfeit that mother's life because he couldn't get the heart of the Christian community to do that necessary work any other way. That's just the way we are. It takes that type of thing. And that's one reason people get sick. That's the reason Catherine Watson was sick. So that uh, it would shake us into doing what we wouldn't do otherwise. When I say we, I sent $500 after she died, not before. And I've known Tom for years and years. Yeah. After she died, I sent $500. Well, I knew when he went out there. I wasn't saved then, but I knew when he went. I knew when he went to Japan. Uh, so you see, God uses these things. Now let me show you a very glorious reason some Christians get sick. And I love this one. I've shown it to you before. You may not have all been here. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Starting with verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, or trouble, this word, uh, it means uh, affliction, calamity, distress, trouble. It doesn't mean the great tribulation, it just means uh, a, a trouble and affliction. That we may be able to comfort them who are in any trouble or affliction. The word trouble here is exactly the same as the word tribulation. They're the same word in the original. Both those two words in the fourth verse. Tribulation and trouble. In any trouble, by the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation which is effectual in enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we uh, be comforted is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye also be of the consolation. Now what is Paul saying? He says, some of the suffering that I have, God permits, so that I will understand your suffering better and be able to comfort you. Now here's the whole thought here. God foresees that a weak Christian is going to have to undergo some suffering for one reason or another. And he knows that that affliction would bring that Christian down to despair. And so over here he sees a strong, radiant Christian. And he says, that Christian over there, when they're afflicted, They'll simply glory in it. And it'll make a better Christian out of them. See, suffering either embitters or embetters. He says, I know that Christian will be better. It'll, it'll redound to their eternal glory. 
It's going to be a good thing for them. And here's what will happen. I'll let them have the same affliction that this one over here is going to have that would fall under the onslaught. And they will know exactly how to comfort because they've already received comfort from me. They knew how to appropriate my comfort, but this one over here wouldn't. So I let this one be afflicted in the same manner that this one will be afflicted so that this one can comfort that one with the same comfort whereby I comforted this one. You see that? It's a way that God uses Christians. And in that instance, it's a great compliment to be sick for God. He wants to use that. He wants to use it in the life of another. Of course, this one uh, that he picks on, so to speak, finds out something by going through the experience. They find out they're not afraid of anything. Because, you see, if the worst thing in the world happens to you, and God is sufficient, then what can cause you to fear? Nothing. Fear is a thing of the past. Because the greatest thing that you could possibly fear happened to you, and God was there and upheld you. And now you can really be used, maybe only for a little while. But you might be the only person in the world who could be used. So sometimes it's a very great compliment for a Christian to get sick. God's going to use them in this marvelous way that Paul spoke of there. And now, look at 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, and you'll see what that affliction does. Paul says, for our light affliction, he calls his affliction light, which uh, you ought to read some of it, you think it's light. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He says, every time I'm afflicted in any way, that affliction is working for me. What is it working for you, Paul? It's working for me a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Remember, in uh, Romans 8.18, he says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present age are not to be compared what's the rest of that verse with the glory that shall be revealed in us he says there's just no comparison uh, it's, it's the light is so much lighter when you come out of the darkness you're going to have a greater comparison see God has all of eternity to make up the difference he says the eternal reason why he saved us, that's in Ephesians 2, 7, is so that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding greatness of his mercies or kindness. What is it? In Christ Jesus toward us. Who wants to quote that one for us? Ephesians 2, 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Yeah. That's what he has in mind. So these afflictions that we have work for us. So what should a Christian do if they get sick? What should they do? Well, the very first thing they should do is to thank God for the sickness because he says in everything give thanks. What's the next thing to do? The next thing to do is to take it as a moment, a time of reflection and try to figure out what is God wanting to teach me if, if he's wanting to teach you something? What is this for? Now let's suppose you think it might be because there's sin in your life. Well then if you're a Bible student at all, you simply say, well God, if it's a sin, show it to me. And if I don't know it, I just confess I'm just sinful anyway. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that fixes that up. And he can let you get well in a hurry. But let's suppose you're still sick. And let's suppose you're perplexed about it. I know a 
a wonderful, wonderful Christian in Lakeland, a great soul winner. Most of you would know if I called her name. And she had an affliction. And she'd get the victory for a little while, and then she'd go down in despair. It was a sharp, piercing, pulsating pain in one of her arms. And it just was nerve-wracking. And uh, she'd think she uh, had appropriated the grace of God, and then it would get her down, and she'd go into despair and despondency. And um, she tried to do what she knew she was supposed to do, and that is thank God for it. And uh, it just somehow didn't work for her. She just couldn't get the victory. What was she to do then? The Bible gives instructions in James chapter 5. You just can't get on top of it. You can't get the victory. Go to James chapter 5. Verse 13, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is he merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Yes, I'm sick. What'll I do? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Well, first, who are the elders? Well, the elders are the same as they've always been. The elders are the same in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. That's the spiritual leaders among God's people. It doesn't necessarily mean the people that go to uh, assembly in the same building you do. It means those who are recognized among God's people for their spiritual discernment. That's who you call. Then why do they anoint with oil? For the same reason that oil was used for anointment all through the Bible. Same reason that priests were anointed, kings were anointed, prophets were anointed. The one doing the anointing and the one receiving the anointment were thereby saying, all results, whatever comes of this, I acknowledge it to be by the power of the Spirit because oil is symbolic of the power of the Spirit of God. This is why you anoint with oil. Well, what if you uh, call the elders of the church and you didn't anoint with oil? What if you didn't have any oil on hand? Well, anoint with oil anyway. That is to say, you don't have to physically anoint with oil. Now, if I'm going to be called to, to pray for somebody, I'd like to have uh, some pure oil of some kind and just anoint physically. Because it just shows that I'm willing to do it just like God says. But there's a figurative reason why you anoint with oil. And you can anoint with oil without oil. You see, we just have that kind of a God. Now, not if your attitude's wrong. Well, that's foolish, anointing with oil. No. But if, if somebody calls you to pray for them and there's no oil available, well, anoint them with oil. That is to say, uh, recognize that the power is from God. That's anointing with oil. Now, let's go on. Fifteenth verse. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Now, this saving here doesn't mean save from hell. It means to restore. And it, the same word is so... Uh, translated in some places in the King James Version. It means save you from the same thing that when Peter was sinking below the water, he said, save me. He didn't mean save me from hell. He said, save me from the situation I'm in. Well, God will save them from the situation they're in. And the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When do you call for the elders of the church? When you're perplexed. Why do you call for them? 
is because God will give them discernment to help you to understand why you're sick. That's why you call for them. In fact, you already understand. You don't need to call for the elders of the church. It's for the ill person who's perplexed by their illness. Now, the lady I was telling you about in Lakeland, she did exactly that. And she had quite a room that full there. She, she called everybody in that she thought was a spiritual leader. She looked upon as a spiritual leader. And God just healed her. She knew she was better immediately. And the pulsing pain was gone within two days. This has been about six months ago or more, and it's never come back. And she'd had it for some 18 months. And uh, uh, she gives the glory to God in a very quiet, very spirit-filled way. Not this braggios type of thing. Just like it's supposed to work. This lady was perplexed. You call for the elders of the church for this reason. There are many reasons why Christians are sick. We've been enumerating them. And you need help to understand why it might be that God has permitted you to be ill. You need somebody who has a grasp on the scriptures so that they can show you from God's book the various reasons people are sick. And then you won't, you won't be concerned it won't, you won't uh, be oppressed. So every time you're sick, should you call for the elders of the church? Not necessarily. That's specifically when you just, the, the, the devil is defeating you and you're, and you're perplexed by it. Otherwise, just follow out the ad, admonition of, of uh, verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Just one for another. Call your friends, Christian friends, up and say, look, I have this nagging headache. Would you pray with me about it that the Lord will heal me or, or give me grace to understand? Just pray with me, would you? Call any of your friends up. Let them pray for you over the telephone or what have you. But if you're perplexed, if the devil's using it and you're down and you're defeated and you don't know where to turn, call for the elders of the church and unload your heart there and, and uh, they'll take the scriptures and pray with you. This is God's way. Well, what about all of these, what about this gift of healing and all of these miracle healers? As best I know, they make more people sick than they heal. Uh, I don't have all the answers. I suppose there is such a thing as a person being particularly gifted in this area. There certainly has been. There's there's a scriptural account of such a gift. It's not recorded as one of the major gifts, and and it, uh, people are certainly glorified. All I can say is I don't know of any well-known faith healers whose procedures parallel the scriptures. It doesn't jive with the scriptures. And so regardless of the uh, astounding stories I hear, I just have to say either I'm ignorant of the scriptures or, or this just doesn't fit for me. And I'm sorry. And this is all I know. I happen to be in a position of knowing many Pentecostal people. Uh, most of my relatives are Pentecostal. And uh, part of the Pentecostal doctrine is that the atonement includes healing. That is to say, their doctrinal belief is that when Jesus Christ hung on Calvary's cross, that he did two things for you. He paid your sin debt, and he also purchased for you bodily healing as he hung on the cross. And they have scriptures that they use for this. Therefore, you get healed exactly the same way you get saved. You ask God to save you, and he is, if your heart's right towards him, he has to save you. So you ask him to heal you, and he has to heal you. And if he doesn't heal you, it's because something is desperately wrong with you in your faith. I've probably told you this story. 
I have a, a nephew. He's my older brother's oldest son, Kenny. He's just finished his third year of college at Southeastern Bible College, which is an Assembly of God college in Lakeland. So he's in my home about twice a week. He loves to come over, and he likes his Aunt Dottie's cooking, and uh, it's cheaper to use our washing machine than the one down at the laundromat, and we're glad to have him. He's a fine boy. And uh, a year ago last summer, he had a summer job up in Tallahassee where he lives. He's working on a roof. And a uh, nail uh, hit a nail wrong, and it flipped up and hit him in the eye and uh, put his eye out. And uh, he was convinced that uh, he'd been to a lot of these healing services and things that God would give him a new eye. And he prayed uh, to this end. He told me, he said, I'm not worried about my eye, Uncle Don, and God's going to give me a new one. I've got the best praying people in the world praying for me. He says, he's just going to give me a new one just like that. Well, time went on, and God didn't give him a new eye. And Kenny got lower and lower and lower and lower. And I said, Kenny, something's bothering you. The fellow says, tell me about it. And he says, you know, Uncle Don, he says, I don't even like to go home anymore says that my mother is all uh, disturbed. She, uh, she's uh, disappointed because I don't have enough faith for God to heal me and because I've sort of given up. And uh, he says, I don't really mind not having the eye, but he says, I sure do hate that I'm such a poor Christian that I don't have that much faith. And that's the thing that bothers me. And I guess I'm just not what I'm supposed to be. And he was really down. I know I've told you folks this, but uh, it fits the, the lesson anyway. I said, Kenny, I was working in my yard. I said, let's suppose I fell down. I had an accident here, and I just mang broke my arm, mangled it horribly, and so the bone's actually poking out through the skin. And I had two choices. I could have somebody take me down to the emergency room at the hospital, or I could go in the house and ask God to heal me and just refuse any kind of help until God healed me. Now, which of those two things would manifest the most faith in God? And he said, well, obviously, if you refuse to go to the emergency room and if you uh, uh, you'd just ask God to heal your arm and believe that he would. And I says, Kenny, your whole problem is that you don't understand faith. I said, uh, that's no faith. If every time something happens to me, whether it's little or big, I can just say, well, now, God, do this for me. And he whipped to and do it just like that. Well, I wouldn't have to have any faith pretty soon. I'd be walking by sight, not by faith. I said, now, here's faith. Here I am with my broken arm. And I get a sling and I put it in and I get somebody and all the time that thing just pulsing with pain. I'm riding in the hospital and I'm saying, God, you said and everything gives thanks, so I thank you that I've got a broken arm. No doubt there's somebody right down in that emergency room needs to be saved and I'm going to tell them how you saved me and see if I can't get them saved. Or maybe if nobody down there listen to me, uh, I can, people will see my arm in a, in a sling here and uh, anybody asks me about it, I'll remind me to witness to them. Or maybe you want to lay me aside away so I can pray for my neighbors. But I know you got a reason uh, for letting me have this broken arm. And it has spiritual implications. And I just don't want to miss the point, God. Now, that's faith, Kenny. Well, he's, uh, he's bounced back pretty good now. He still hasn't quite follow along but uh, he, he's, he's resolved the fact he's never going to get another eye and at least he's beginning to appropriate uh, the grace of God which is a much bigger victory in his life and his mother's finally come out of it but I see these people you know sometimes they're the sickest bunch of people I ever saw I think sometimes God accommodates them
they love to get healed so much that it may be that God just uh, well you know there's a verse in uh, the psalm psalm uh, 106 verse 15 it says uh, God gave them the desires of their hearts and sent leanness into their souls I'll tell you I don't know how you feel about it but if I heard a big healer was coming to Groveland I'd go to Claremont or somewhere else uh, I uh, I don't quite understand the type of humility that names a university after yourself or uh, uh, if those offices his his wife's and his his own office or anything like that they've been described to me uh, just doesn't go along that's not the my idea of, of following in Christ's footsteps and excuse me if I found, sound cynical maybe I am but it just doesn't jive with me and I know I've heard all kind of testimonies uh, my brother's wife's father testifies of being healed miraculously at a meeting conducted by this particular individual <laughs> You say, how do you explain that? I don't explain it. I don't try to explain anything that I can't uh, dovetail with the scriptures. But I do know this. I don't know uh, who of the... I know some of them are of Satan. I don't know which ones. I'm not trying to put things on any of them. I know some of them are. And uh, I know Satan's a great healer. As a matter of fact, if Satan wants to heal somebody, all he has to do is stop doing what he's doing. He knows how to make people sick. A great part of the illness is through demonic oppression. And Satan uh, uh, gigging, especially Christians, with guilt feelings and all such as that. And it makes them sick. If he wanted to heal them, all he has to do is stop doing that and they'll be healed. He can tie people up in knots. I've seen people under the demonic... Uh, uh, oppression until they just lay out on the floor absolutely stiff just like a board well that person's sick if Satan wants to stop uh, make them well all he has to do is take his de demonic power away and they'll get well fast he's a great healer great miracle worker well we've gone on for some time here but I trust that we've been able to find some things in the scriptures that would help you to understand maybe sometimes why you're sick or at least know what to do if you get sick and don't understand it God has provision for everything shall we pray Father we thank you for this marvelous book we thank you that everything that pertains to this life is answered right here if we search it out and appropriate it thank you in Jesus name Amen